Um, so my name is Lena again. I'm coming from Boston Medical Center, and I'm the currently the infectious disease PGY2 pharmacy resident. And today we're here to talk about sexually transmitted infections. The objectives of this lecture would be uh, these are the some of the objectives that you're going to be uh, tested on for each of the STIs that we're going to talk about. The four different types of STI we're going to talk about are going to be chlamydia, gonorrhea syphilis as well as genital herpes. For each of those, just make sure you're able to identify the risk factors, the epidemiology, as well as the treatment options and clinical presentations. And then for each of the drugs that are selected for treatment, just be able to understand um, the, the brand as well as the generic, the doses, and the duration of treatment. So for each of the SDI, we're going to go through infection, the causative pathogens, as well as the treatment options. Some abbreviations to keep in mind are going to be here. We're going to be incorporating some of these, um, some of these um, abbreviations such as HIV or STI, um, standing for sexually transmitted infection. So kind of just using this throughout the lecture. Some medical terminology that you will be tested on are gonna be what is sexually transmitted disease, what is a shanker in the context of syphilis, and then expedited um, partner therapy for chlamydia as well as Jaris um, Herxmeyer reaction in syphilis as well as latent herpes, uh, latent virus where well, we're talking about herpes, and um, the surveillance of gonococcal antimicrobial susceptibility as well. So some of you might have uh, downloaded a, uh, a slide that doesn't have pictures, or other of you might have downloaded the, the ones with the pictures. But for those of you who don't want to look at those not so appealing pictures, it's gonna, they're going to be a stop sign prior to the picture so you can look away. All right, so we're going to go, before talking about the different types of STDs, we're going to talk about what is the difference between incidence and prevalence, and what is the cost of <clears throat> these STDs uh, to the healthcare. So basically, the CDC estimates that there are over 20 million reported cases of STD in a year, per year. And the prevalence is basically how much of that STD cases are currently present. So every year there are 20 reported new cases, and overall there's 110 million reported cases of STD. ST, treatment of STD as well as complication comes at a cost to the healthcare, and that is estimated to be $16, million, $16 billion, and that is per year. And the estimate is in 2010, so you could basically imagine where we are at uh, today in 2017. So going into 2016, where are we at? with some of the reported uh, cases of STI. The reported as well as the uh, surveilled STIs include chlamydia, gonorrhea, as well as syphilis. These are just the reported ones. Um, some other STDs are not reported to the CDC. So in 2016, there was over 1.5 million reported cases of chlamydia, which is actually an increase from 2015. And that is the same for gonorrhea, so basically, we're seeing an increase in both um, the incidence as well as the prevalence of these STIs every year. STI is very common among the youth, um, especially in those who are in the ages of 15 to 24, and this is because they're at their peak of their sexual, they're starting um, to become sexually active, so there are more risks for STD. As you can see here, <clears throat> Chlamydia and gonorrhea are one of the most common ones that these young teens as well as young adults are being affected with. Some of, just tracking the STIs in the past from 1985 to 2015, you can see how there is a steady uh, increase of chlamydia starting in the 1980s. And there's actually a recent rise uh, that we're starting to see with syphilis, even though it is kind of 
uh, below 60 cases per year, but we are seeing a lot of cases kind of the reemergence of syphilis compared to the other um, STIs. Gonorrhea has been seen to decrease, however, we can start seeing how it started increasing in 2013. In 2013, that you can start seeing a peak there. Some risk factors to keep in mind, and we will be talking about these as we go through the different STIs, are going to be um, young age, like we talked about, they are at their earlier stage of their sexual activities, um, gender, depending on the different types of STI that we're going to be talking about, women are going to be at a higher risk for chlamydia versus men are going to be at more risk for gonorrhea, but we'll be talking about these. Uh, behavioral risk are also some of the risk factors that will put patients at risk for STI. <clears throat> the CDC identifies these five major uh, strategies for prevention and controlling of STD in the United States. So the number one will be accurate, accurately assessing the risk of these patients and counseling them um, that that they should that. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, accurately assessing these patients who are at risk and their partners, um, counseling them is really important to prevent the spread as well as um, the spread of these STIs. Um, Pre-exposure vaccination of persons at risk for vaccine preventable STIs such as HPV is really important. To, um, making sure that these young adults are being uh, vaccinated Identification of asymptomatic as well as symptomatic patients um, should be um, identified and properly assessed. Effective diagnosis as well as treatment and counseling and follow-up should be done for these types of STIs. So going into the different types of STI, we'll have a roadmap of going through these different types of STI. So we'll start off with epidemiology, going to the different risk factors for each of these special STI. We'll talk about microbiology and how we can diagnose them, the pathophysiology and the clinical presentations, as well as um, the treatment options, and then some follow-ups that are recommended by the CDC. Going into bacterial and chlamydial infection, and then we'll finish up with viral infection, we'll go into chlamydia. So chlamydia <clears throat> is one of the most reported and one of the most common STIs according to the CDC. In 2016, there were over 1.5 million reported cases and these were <clears throat> this attributed to more than 50% um, of non-gonococcal urethritis, which is basically a irritation of the urethra, which mostly is caused by gonorrhea but in other cases, chlamydia can contribute to this as well. The rate, um, as you can see, that women are at, at a higher risk for chlamydia compared to chlamydia compared to men. So women tend to be more asymptomatic, and they're not able to identify that they're even infected. Um, this can actually contribute to a lot of more uh, complications, such as pelvic inflammatory disease, which can progress into infertility if left untreated, or even ectopic pregnancy, or even um, chronic pelvic um, infections. <clears throat> so the risk factors for chlamydia will be young, young adults as well as teens. As you can see here, chlamydia, patient, uh, adult, uh, teens who are between the ages of 14 and 24 at a higher risk, contributing to over 65% of the cases that are reported to the CDC. Some other risk factors that put patients um, <clears throat> that are associated with chlamydia infection are going to be um, new or multiple sex partners, history of uh, prior STIs, or even uh, presence of any other type of STIs, such as gonorrhea, or syphilis, or even HIV oral contraceptive users or lack of barrier contraception. So these patients are at high risk because they think that they're protecting themselves uh, from pregnancy, however, they don't put it into account of protecting themselves uh, from STIs by using uh, barrier protection. <clears throat> so 
chlamydia, Trachomotis, is, um, is an obligate intracellular with a gram-negative like uh, cell wall. So what do we mean by obligate intracellular? So what that means is basically they're not able to carry out energy metabolism on their own and they're very dependent on the host cell. So when they're stained on the gram stain, they look more like a gram negative looking like bacteria. They're used, they actually used to be confused uh, to be a virus because they do act like a virus. They can't function on their own. Um, even though they have an outer membrane with um, LPS like gram, uh, gram negative bacteria, they do lack these um, peptidoglycan layer. Going into the pathophysiology, so these organisms um, gain access to the whole cell through, um, if there's any break in the skin through either sexual intercourse, uh, specifically in the, uh, specifically in the, uh, in the mucosal uh, uh, epithelial cells. So those are mostly found in the, either the fallopian tube, the endocervical canal, uh, the urethra, as well as um, it can either be the oral uh, going down into the respiratory as well as the GI so, uh, system. So they tend to attach to these mucosal areas. So kind of keeping that in mind is going to be helpful in identifying the clinical presentations um, because they do love to go to those um, mucosal areas. Uh, once they gain access into the body through the break, they tend to travel to the lymphatic system as well as um, the bloodstream and they gain access to different parts of the body, including vital organs. Chlamydia is highly transmittable and they're mostly transmitted through uh, sexual contact. It could either be uh, via anally, vaginally, or even orally. Women who are affected with chlamydia um, and are not treated adequately can transmit chlamydia to their uh, infant. And it is uh, one of the main causes of conjunctivitis in um, the newborn, and these uh, neonates have to be treated once exposed. Okay. So going into the testing and diagnosis, <clears throat> um, the tests to identify chlamydia rely uh, basically on the secretions that we get from either um, <clears throat> the vagina or the, uh, the rectum, um, as well as urine, which is a little bit less invasive. So these uh, samples are removed by uh, just a simple swab. The ideal and preferred method of identification will be uh, the NAT or nucleic acid amplification test. So what this basically does is it looks at the amplified DNA that is specific to the chlamydia and it, it, and it is able to identify it. The FDA actually does not recommend getting samples from oropharyngeal or rectal samples, and that is because the test is, can't produce a false positive. Um, culture can be used as well for chlamydia. However, it has a, a very um, long, long turnaround time, so it can take a while and the patient might um, have completed the treatment before we get the result. So a lot of times the NAT is more helpful because it's more rapid compared to a culture. <clears throat> so going to the different clinical presentations, by breaking it down by male and female, after exposure, the incubation period can, um, can be up to a month for both female and male. <clears throat> However, chlamydia is known as the silent STI, and this is because patients are mostly asymptomatic. Um, over 50% se over of male or close to 70% of female are mostly asymptomatic and they don't even know that they have it. So you can imagine the risk of transmission between, um, between sexual par partners if they're not aware of their infection. Um, symptoms can appear uh, between one to three weeks after the incubation period, which is basically the time after exposure, the bacteria is taking time to replicate um, and infect the host. 
So some of the symptoms that you could see in female are going to include vaginal discharge, are going to include vaginal discharge, as well as um, some irritation. It could be as non-specific as UTI symptoms, or it could be um, as very common as uh, as very common as some discharges. Okay. Um, so comparing the discharges between um, gonococcal urethritis and chlamydial urethritis, you can see that um, in gonococcal it's more mucoidy, which we'll be talking about later, versus in chlamydial it's going to be more watery um, uh, discharge that you would see both in male and female. <clears throat> so if chlamydia is left untreated, it can cause severe consequences, both in male and female, but mostly in women, and that is because they don't identify their symptoms until it's too late or until the complication has already happened. So, so some of the complications that are associated, sorry, um, some are, sorry guys, this, okay. So some of the complications that are associated uh, with the female uh, is gonna be pelvic inflammatory disease. So basically the bacteria has um, ascended into the fallopian tube and into the uterus and it's causing inflammation. And uh, patients most likely won't know this until they have chronic pain in their um, abdomen and they present and some, and that in public information can actually progress into ectopic pregnancy or even infertility in women. In men, even though it is rare, uh, epididymitis can be caused, and this is the inflammation of the epididymis, which basically carries the sperm. Um, and in rare cases, it can cause infertility because you have that chronic scarring of the epididymis. Um, Ryder's syndrome can happen in both ma uh, male and female, and that is basically just a reactive arthritis. So the bacteria has gained access to these different parts of the joints and the muscles, and you will tend to see arthritis associated with um, chlamydia. And this is normally what you would see if left untreated. <clears throat> so chlamydia is a treatable and curable STI, the first line agent are going to be azithromycin one times dose. Um, <clears throat> so this is most commonly given in the clinic, or even it could be given in um, outpatient in the pharmacy. Azithromycin is a lot of times preferred, uh, especially in patients that we don't know uh, they will have good compliance, or we don't rely on them going to the pharmacy and taking them. So a lot of, a lot of times clinics will just dispense it right away and give it to them and wash them until they take it. Um, doxycycline, however, can be an option for those patients who are not able to take azithromycin for either allergy or uh, side effect issues. And then some alternatives are gonna be erythromycin, which has very poor compliance issues, and that is because of the GI side effects that is associated with erythromycin, and it is taken four times a day. Um, levofloxacin and ofloxacin can also be an option. Um, however, patients do need to take it for seven days, and they tend to sometimes be more expensive than a one-time dose of azithromycin. <clears throat> all right, and then all patients with chlamydia, once they have been treated adequately, they should be following up after three months of completion, and that is to prevent reinfection. Like we said, patients are mostly asymptomatic, both in female and male, and after completion, just to ensure that they're not reinfected, we need to follow up with these patients. However, if not able to follow up in three months, it is um, okay to follow up in six or 12 months, whatever, whatever works for the patient. The CDC does not recommend test of cure. <clears throat> Unless we are uh, suspecting um, an adherence, uh, non-adherence to medication, or if the symptoms persist after the completion of treatment, or even if we're concerned for reinfection, we should be considering test of cure, which is basically testing 
again for chlamydia after completing a treatment. Um, if we are considering a test of cure, we should be waiting at least three to four time, uh, through three to four weeks uh, prior to the test, and that is because testing at any less than three weeks causes a false positive. <clears throat> Patients who are infected with chlamydia are at a higher rate, uh, at a higher risk of getting infected with other infections such as gonorrhea as well as syphilis or even HIV. Um, so they, ne they need to be uh, screened for these different type of STIs as well, just because their susceptibility increases after the first infection. Patients should be also counseled on abstaining from sexual intercourse uh, for at least seven days after completion of their uh, treatment. Uh, Okay, once patients are infected, it's important to educate them and their partners, and if possible, to treat their uh, recent sexual partners in the last 60 days uh, using the, either the expedited therapy, uh, partner therapy or even uh, providing education to the patient so that they can take it to their partners. So what does expedited partner therapy mean? So EPT is basically uh, providing treatment to partners without testing them for it. <clears throat> so this is basically a public health initiative that was um, started to reduce the spread of disease. Uh, just knowing that chlamydia is asymptomatic and patients are at risk for a reinfection, if we're treating their partners while we're treating the patient, that could potentially decrease the spread of the disease. Um, generally, the expedited partner therapy is only for chlamydia, uh, as far as uh, STIs go, and it's only for heterosexual partners, and that is because there is a higher risk of co-infection with other STIs and MSM, and they should be screened for uh, some other potential <coughs> STIs uh, before, we, uh, before we expose them to these treatments. Um, so they need more uh, evaluation, more screening, more risk assessment, those MSM, just because they're at a more higher risk of reinfection, uh, higher risk of co-infection with other STIs. It is important to keep in mind that even though the CDC recommends um, EPT, not all states are in agreement with that, and checking in with the different, checking with the state department is really important Massachusetts does allow the treatment of partners under the EPT, but there are some states that are against it. So the way it goes is basically, once a patient comes in, gets screened, they get treated, and they, t they uh, tell the clinician, clinician that they want um, uh, a treatment for their partner or the clinician uh, kind of initiates the treatment what happens is they either uh, give them a prescription in a separate bottle or they could give them a prescription in hand, a written prescription, and they can take that and fill in. They don't have to put it under a specific name. They can write EPT on it. And that is um, if the patient is concerned for any um, confidential issues or if they don't feel comfortable taking that to their partner or if their partner doesn't um, um, agree with that. Does anybody uh, have any experience with EPT working outpatient? Outpatient in the pharmacy? No? That's surprising. I usually have a few people every year. <laughs> okay, you have oh, some people yeah. there? Yeah. So what has happened with you guys when you've had people take EPT at your pharmacy? Did you guys run it under like an insurance or did they pay out of pocket? I don't remember. At our pharmacy, we don't allow them to go through insurance because we don't have insurance. Yeah. 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 So those are like some of the issues because um, the issues that we can come up with. Um, if a prescription is written under EPT, we don't know what who the patient is, uh, who the prescription is written for. We can't run it under insurance. Uh, the patient has to technically pay out of pocket, which can 
Okay, did you want to say something? Yeah, and then the other question that usually comes up with this is like, if it's written under EPT, were you, were you guys there when the person came to pick up their prescription? How did they ask for it? Because if it's under the name EPT, did they go, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here for my EPT? If I remember correctly, I think the patient, that was like the person that it was it for was the one that did it. The partner that was originally infected. And that's probably the most common, but it's things to think about for when you're in community practice. How would you approach this? What would you do? What's going to happen? Yes, ma'am. So what happens if like you don't know the patient's information, so you have no idea if they have allergies or any other reasons that they should have taken? So you just have to like go on good faith if you don't have that information? What do you think? That's a really good question. Um, so basically, just asking the partner who's picking up as many questions as possible without identifying the patient is important. Uh, just asking them any allergies, are they pregnant, um, or any mm -hmm. risk for pregnancy, especially in azithromycin, and just kind of basically assessing that is really helpful without identifying the patient's um, identity. And I posted to Blackboard the um, CMR for EPT, if anyone is interested in reading it. And because I didn't know which states don't allow it. It's prohibited in Kentucky and South Carolina. FYI, any of you are planning on moving there? <laughs> yeah. I thought Oklahoma was too, but probably not. Uh, they're potentially allowable. Oh. Okay. Same with New Jersey, Virginia, Delaware, South Dakota, and uh, Kansas are potentially That's allowable. That's a lot of states. Um, yeah. Yes. So this might vary per um, place, but how do you add it into the computer if you have any other That's a very good question. For the two of you who have done this in the community, how did you guys add it into the computer if you're not adding it under a direct patient name? And that's what I've heard from people who've done it. I won't lie, I have not worked in a community pharmacy since 2010. So when this came up, I, I called my friends for a community pharmacist and I was like, can, can you help me look smart in front of students? How does this work? And that's what I was told, is they have like an EPT profile that they run things out of, um, is my understanding. But that's a great question. How many of you still work community pharmacy? How many of you are going to go ask your pharmacist now, what do you do if this happens? Because I know if I was working and this happened and you're like having 10 million scripts, I would have a little bit of a conniption and be like, ah, um, I, I have to go talk to my pharmacist. <laughs> so it's a great thing to start thinking about right now. Like, what is our policy behind EPT? What can we do? And didn't you say that your someone said their pharmacy doesn't do it? Did I just hear that or am I hallucinating, which is always possible? Okay, then never mind. I just haven't <laughs> had breakfast yet, so it's very possible I'm hallucinating. Yes, it is true. <laughs> I am aware of that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to faculty life. Um, yeah, so this is all about like what you should do if you're in the situation. So like if you're in the That's a very good question. That's never come up for me. That I don't know. I don't think there is a limit. You would want to treat all the partners as much as possible. Um, I mean, the options are either you send them to a pharmacy or clinics actually dispense it in a bottle and label it as EPT and they take it for their partners. Um, so I don't think there is a limit, but if there is, I'll let you know. <clears throat> right. So our role as a pharmacist would be basically to counsel patients that come through for EPT or just picking up their prescription. It's important to counsel patients on abstaining from sexual intercourse while they're being actively treated for this infection. And that is just to prevent the risk of reinfection uh, from their partners. And that basically is gonna account as being a failure of treatment even though they did get reinfected. So abstaining, uh, from sexual intercourse is important. Use of condoms as well as um, uh, use of condoms as well as practicing se safe sex can also avoid future reinfection. And even providing information sheet to the to their partners to encourage them to be treated is also important to prevent um, <coughs> reinfection. 
Um, some other counseling points would be to counsel patients to take the entire treatment course. So if they're doing azithromycin, to make sure that they take the full dose. Um, if they're taking doxycycline, to complete the seven-day course treatment. And then making sure that we're assessing their allergies and then counseling them on the possible GI effect. And this is important because if patients vomit um, within an hour of taking the medication, <clears throat> they should be contacting their provider because they haven't really absorbed the medication and it won't be effective. <clears throat> and then um, basically this is also, uh, can be found at the Massachusetts Department of Health. Um, and just this basically goes through what is chlamydia, what are the different types of com complications or symptoms associated with chlamydia, and the treatment as well. <clears throat> so we basically talked about the different uh, issues that can come up with filling EPT, as well as, well as uh, billing issues or even ensuring that patients are appropriately counseled and uh, followed up a clinic. <clears throat> Any questions before we go into a patient case? All right, um, so I made a minor um, adjustment to this slide. Um, on your slide, it says that the gonorrhea is positive, but I put it as negative just because we didn't talk about gonorrhea. So if you can adjust that on your slide. Now we're gonna talk about this patient. So we have a patient, HI, who's a 23-year-old uh, female who presents to clinic for routine annual visit. She reports some recent increase in vaginal discharge. She's sexually active with approximately eight lifetime partners. Her social history is consistent with uh, five beers per week. She denies tobacco or, or IV drug use. She states that she does not have any drug <coughs> allergies and is not taking any pres uh, prescribed medications. She tells you that she uses intermittent protection with her most recent partner, and she only does vaginal intercourse. When the urine was tested for NAT, it was positive for chlamydia and negative for gonorrhea. The UA is unrevealing, so she doesn't have UTI. <clears throat> Which of the following is the most appropriate therapy? Do you guys have your clicker? Can you read the number off to them? Did y'all get it at the start of the lecture? No. No. Oh, yeah. Just Do I need it? Uh, right here. Yeah, so it's 148796. <laughs> and perusing the law, it just says partner or partners. It doesn't give any numbers. From what I've I've read previously, and I was just double checking, it doesn't. It's oh, very never. nondescript for the CMR. It just says partner or partners, and then for all subsequent bullet, it just says partner. But I, I don't see anything legally that says like only up to the first five customers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Is there a limit? And they said no. It's however yeah. many partners. Yeah. Have, so there's no limit. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. Crowdsourcing an answer. Thank you. You need to play. And remember, you have to pull this down to have five. <coughs> five answers. And now it's playing, so. Should I bring this to the other side? You don't have to. Everybody submit their answer? Yeah. Ooh, 100%. See, such a struggle. Okay. It was 100%. What yeah, they can see it on there. Yeah. Just you can see it? Okay. <laughs> All right, so azithromycin would be the appropriate um, therapy choice in this case. So we're gonna start moving into gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is, uh, according to the CDC, it's the second most commonly reported bacterial um, STI with significant public health problems. 
Just in 2016, there was about 468,000 reported cases, and that is an increase by 18.5% from 2015. The areas of the U.S. that are mostly affected are going to be the southern part of the country, uh, with D.C. being uh, one of the most areas that had the highest reported cases. Even though gonorrhea had similar rates in both men and women in the past, you can start seeing how in 2013 and 14, there is a rise in uh, reported cases in men compared to women. Some risk factors associated with gonorrhea are sexual behaviors such as multiple or new sex partners, or even S MSM. Um, exchange of sex for drug or money can actually put patients at risk as well. As you can tell um, from this uh, bar graph, men who have uh, sex with men are at a high, are higher risk for getting um, gonorrhea as compared to men who have sex with women or even uh, women. <clears throat> Some other risk factors are also uh, socioeconomic status as well as urban residents, and that is just kind of tying back to they don't seek, um, they don't have access to public health, uh, public, um, they don't have access to health care, so they are uh, at a higher risk. Um, during 2012 and 16, gonorrhea rates actually increased among all races. However, uh, the reported cases of gonorrhea are disproportionately high in uh, African American, uh, African Americans. Yes. So that's why it said females is a risk factor. Yeah, um, it used to be, and then. And then they started becoming more um, kind of similar. And then from 2012 and 2013, you can start seeing that uh, ca more cases are reported in male compared to women. So women used to be uh, prior to 2012. So going into pathophysiology, Neisseria gonorrhea is a gram-negative intracellular uh, diplococci. Again, it does depend on the host cell for its energy and nutrient, um, and it uses a pili um, in order to infect the host cell. So what basically happens is the pili attaches to the epithelial cell of the host cell, and it gets endocytosed, and then it starts replicating while inside the epithelial cell and it starts getting released. <clears throat> um, uh, gonorrhea can also damage the, these epithelial cells while they're getting removed from the cell and start infecting different parts of the body. They are uh, gonorrhea is officially transmitted um, through sexual contact or it can even be transmitted from a mother to uh, the fetus at time of birth. Gonorrhea puts patients at a high risk for other STIs as well as HIV, and that is why it's important to screen these patients for other STIs as well. Um, the thought behind why patients who are infected with gonorrhea are more susceptible to HIV is that because they're shedding the virus, uh, which puts them at risk for um, getting gonococcal um, infection. Going into the testing and diagnosis, um, gonorrhea can be diagnosed with gram staining, and it is a diplococci, and a lot of times um, it's uh, considered to be diagnostic if it's found intracellularly. So the extracellular might not be as pathogenic as the intracellular. It's once they're inside a, an epithelial cell that they tend to cause infection. Antimicrobial susceptibility can be done using a culture. Um, and this is important in gonorrhea as we are going to be talking about treatment and uh, monitoring of the susceptibility pattern in the United States because um, using a culture is really helpful in identifying which antibiotics are susceptible. Other tests that could be used are going to be nucleic acid 
um, hybridization or nucleic acid ampli amplification test. And those are um, kind of molecular tests that are more specific to picking up the DNA of the gonorrhea. It does allow um, to testing to be done on different um, specimens, including urine testing. <clears throat> the clinical presentations. So the incubation is going to be, again, similar between the male and female. Um, and then the infection can be either asymptomatic or symptomatic. It really just depends on the patient. <clears throat> when symptoms are present, however, it's mainly nonspecific, such as abdominal pain, um, vaginal discharge, as well as um, bleeding, or even um, dysuria or, um, or, dysuria or um, lower abdominal pain. <clears throat> Men tend to seek treatment uh, faster compared to women, and that's because they can identify these dysuria, um, and it can be more pronounced in men. Compared to women, women tend to not identify those because it's just so nonspecific symptoms that they're getting um, until it, it tends to be um, late, later in the stage, which can cause uh, complications such as um, PID, which we'll be talking about. So the one thing to the one thing that identifies gonorrhea from chlamydia is going to be the purulent urethral or rectal discharge. So this is going to be more mucoidy compared to a clear discharge that we saw in chlamydia. <clears throat> so as you can see, these discharges can be from anywhere, such as the urethra or endocervical canal, or even the eyes. Um, and it does tend to affect the mucosal um, cells as well. Again, some complications associated with um, gonorrhea are gonna be similar to chlamydia, uh, both in men and women, which are gonna be pelvic inflammatory disease, epididymitis, um, you can see some prostatitis in men. Um, and then, if left untreated, gonorrhea can cause disseminated gonorrhea. So what that basically means is it's leaving the genital areas and going to the rest of the body to vital organs and causing some complications. Um, <clears throat> some complications, and that is, um, that is because the bacteria goes into the blood and it gains access to the different parts of the body such as um, such as the heart, the brain, um, causing endocarditis or even meningitis. Um, gonococcal isolate surveillance project. So this is a surveillance um, that was established in 1986 to monitor antim antimicrobial resistance trends in Neisseria gonorrhea. And that is because in they have gonococcal infections have been associated with antibiotic resistance. It's a, basically a collaboration between um, local laboratories as well as STD clinics at, with the CDC. And what they do is these labs collect samples and send it to uh, the CDC after they get their susceptibility um, rate. So they test the, the isolates against different types of antimicrobials. And the CDC kind of collects that and releases that every year in order to provide data to the public health um, and guide providers in choosing the right antibiotics. And the CDC provides recommendation based off of the results from this project. Some antibiotics that used to be used for gonococcal infection um, used to be penicillin, tetracycline, or even sulfonamides. However, these antibiotics have become resistant over time, and they are no longer a treatment option. And the treatment option currently is gonna be uh, cephalosporin plus azithromycin. Um, the use of these two drug classes is gonna be important in gonorrhea, which, is really which has been building resistance over time, and by using these two different types of antibiotics with different mechanism of action, we're improving treatment effectiveness as well as decreasing the rate of resistance potentially. 
In the recent years, there has been some increase in subtriaxone and azithromycin MIC. So who knows what MIC is? Yeah? Do you want to give us like a one-liner what MIC means? So it's the minimum inhibitory concentration, so it's the lowest concentration of the drug that's needed to kill all the pathogens. Exactly, yeah. So what does it mean if we have an elevated MIC? Need a higher dose. I'm sorry, what was that? You need a higher dose. A higher dose, right? So you need to expose the patient to a higher dose in order to overcome that resistance because the bacteria has started becoming more smarter and building these resistance um, and you're going to start needing the to increase the dose but that's not going to be feasible with antibiotics because um, it comes with a cost so we can't really always increase the dose so that's when you have a resistant isolate so in the past so in 2009 from 2009 to 2011 12 there was an increase in the mic of cefexine and that is why the CDC actually removed cefexine from being a first-line agent for the treatment of gonorrhea. And that is because of this rate, uh, risk for resistance. So cefexime is no longer uh, recommended as a first-line agent, and um, subtraxone still remains to be the first-line agent, cephalosporin. Um, in recent years, which is actually starting to get more scary, is that there has been some reported um, cases of um, elevated MIC for azithromycin as well, and that is the second agent that we're using on top of the subtraxone. And you can see that in 2016, the MICs have been in the 1.5 uh, 1 and 1, um, susceptible being 0.25 and less. So going into treatment options, the first line agents that are recommended, again, are going to be your backbone, subtraxone plus azithromycin. For uncomplicated urethral or cervical or rectal infection, <clears throat> as well as pharyngeal infection, subtraxone plus um, azithromycin is recommended <coughs> at uh, the same dose. Cefexine can be considered for as an alternative for those uncomplicated treatments. However, it's not recommended for a pharyngeal infection and that is because oral cephalosporins have insufficient um, efficacy for treating pharyngeal um, infection. There is a lot of theory behind why pharyngeal infection is really hard to treat and some of those are gonna be treatment failure um, associated with maybe there isn't enough um, blood flow going into the pharyngeal infection, or maybe these patients are getting reinfected um, uh, through oral um, or pharyngeal infection. Uh, disseminated gonococcal infection has to be treated depending on where it has disseminated to. So if it disseminated to um, the CNS and causes meningitis, it has to be treated for 14 days. Or if it disseminated to um, the joints and it's causing arthritis, it could be treated up to seven days. And we will be using a higher dose of subtraxone in this case, uh, one to two grams versus 250 milligrams. Um, for those patients who are not able to use azithromycin for allergy reasons, doxycycline can be considered. However, there is an increased rate of uh, resistance and it's recommended to do a culture and antimicrobial susceptibility um, if possible. For those patients who have penicillin allergy, um, it is important to kind of assess what type of reactions that these patients have been getting, um, that they reported they have penicillin allergy. So um, nausea, vomiting wouldn't be count, counted as allergy, it would be either rash, um, or anaphylaxis. However, even with that, if a patient has penicillin, the cross-reactivity to a third generation of cephalosporins, such as subtraxone, wouldn't even, um, it would be even more negligible because there's 2.5% cross-reactivity to a first generation cephalosporin, such as cephalexin or cefazolin. But when talking about third generation, it will be even less to the point that it's negligible. So patients should be um, considered for these um, cephalosporins. 
However, if they have an IgE mediated reaction, such as um, Stephen John syndrome, they shouldn't be challenged for this and they should be um, treated for these gonorrhea in uh, consultation with an uh, infectious disease specialist. Some alternative agents that can be considered for these patients with severe, severe allergy are going to be demifloxacin or demifloxacin plus azithromycin or gentamicin plus azithromycin. Uh, so patients with uncomplicated um, urogenital or rectal gon gonorrhea who are treated with the recommended or alternative regimen shouldn't be um, having a test of cure, and that is because these agents are very effective, effective because we're using two agents with two different mechanisms of action to treat them. However, the CDC recommends getting a test of cure for pharyngeal um, infection, and that is because um, it is associated with either reinfection or even treatment failure, like we talked about. And the recommended time to do a test of cure is 14 days after treatment completion. Um, either the NAB or culture can be uh, performed, but it's highly recommended that they get both culture and um, the nucleic acid amplification test. And that is because to see what they were treated with was susceptible. So we are not ex re-exposing them to a medication that they were resistant to. All patients should follow up with their PCP uh, clinic in three months, and that is just to assess them again for reinfection, and these patients are gonna be at even increased risk when they, once they have gone a first um, infection. And recent sexual partners within the last 60 days should also be assessed. Abstaining from sexual intercourse, kind of same goes as we talked about in chlamydia, they should be abstaining from sexual activity um, seven days after completion of treatment to prevent reinfection. Some, um, sometimes patients might fail at treatment. So the times that we should be considering treatment failure just because gonorrhea is associated with um, <clears throat> antibiotic resistant is going to be if their symptom resolution hasn't, if their symptom hasn't resolved in the last, um, in the first three to five days and they haven't had any sexual um, intercourse post-treatment. And post -posit uh, positive test of cure with no reported sexual contact in um, post-treatment follow-up period is also some of the things that will kind of help us think why our patients not responding to an, uh, um, their antibiotic treatment. Um, positive culture 30 days after treatment with elevated MIC, regardless of sexual con contact, can also put patients at uh, risk for treatment failure because the antibiotics that we gave them wasn't effective if the MIC is elevated. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna do another case for gonorrhea before we finish up. <clears throat> so we have PJ, who's a 48-year-old female, I mean, sorry, a 48-year-old male with HIV, presents to clinic with new onset discharge from his genital area. He notes increased urinary frequency about eight times per day. He notes that his partner also had these symptoms about two weeks ago and was treated with antibiotics for gonorrhea in the same clinic. His partner urged him to, go, to come today to get checked out. He has penicillin allergy, which he reports as having nausea and headache. His urine test is positive for gonorrhea. <clears throat> Which of the following is the best treatment option for this patient? Thirteen responses. <clears throat> All right. So it looks like the majority of you answered C, which is the right 
answer in this case. Um, and then some of you answer D. So what are our options? Let's see. So why did you guys choose D? Oh, okay. <laughs> fair enough. Okay, so in this case, these are kind of similar options, except the azithromycin is two grams here, and the recommended is one gram times one. All right. Second question. Symptoms of our patient has resolved. When is... Um, when is repeat testing necessary? All right, it looks like most of you answered B, which is three months after initial treatment. So repeat testing is not necessary Okay, so actually the patient needs to have a repeat testing in, the, uh, in three months after initial treatment. We don't do test of, um, test of cure right after treatment. The patients should follow up in clinic after three months and for, um, get a test of, um, not a test of cure, but retesting. When would you get a 14 days after initial treatment? Yeah, pharyngeal infection because they are at higher risk for treatment failure. Yep, 10 minute break. Okay. I'm going to give you guys 10 minute break and I'm going to stop. reported in 2016 and this is an increase from 17.6 cases 17.6 percent increase from 2005 uh, 15. <clears throat> so during 2000 um, fr fr during the year of 2000 to 2016 there was a rise in the rate of reported pr primary as well as secondary syphilis that attributed to the cases um, that was most common in men so out of all those 27,000 cases reported, 90% um, of those cases are actually reported in men. And out of that, 80.6% 80, 80 were in MSM. So you can definitely see the difference between men and women. Some risk factors associated with syphilis are gonna be sexual behavior, such as um, unpro unprotected sex or multiple sex partners, and then you can see just the breakdown of men who have sex with men only and comparing that to women or even men um, who have sex with women only. So this is um, kind of a re-emerging STI in the recent years, uh, mostly in MSM. The regions that are mostly affected are the southern part of the country again. And you do, we do start uh, seeing more cases in the West Coast as well. The causative organism for syphilis is going to be tropomena, uh, troponema pallidum, and it's basically a spirochete. So what that basically means is it has a flagella on, on both ends of the organism, and it tends to use that as a virulence factor to infect its host. It is an obligate uh, parasite as well, depending on the whole cell for its um, energy as well as nutrient. So basically once it's out of the body and has been sitting around, 
um, it kind of doesn't support itself and needs uh, the, the, the nutrient and energy from the host cell. The way it is introduced into the host cell is going to be by penetration uh, through the, a broken skin or a mucosal membrane. Um, and that can disseminate to the rest of the body through the lymphatic system or the bloodstream. It can even involve C, uh, some sort of CNS, um, CNS involvement. And it can happen during any stage of the infection. So it doesn't, it's not really a progression of the disease. It can happen in the primary stage or the first stage of syphilis or secondary stage. It is a highly contagious STI with an estimated risk of 50 to 60% um, after having a single uh, sexual intercourse with an infected individual. It's commonly it's commonly transmitted through sexual intercourse. However, it can also be transferred from a mother to the fetus. And there are some cases of uh, blood transfusions, but we don't tend to see this now just because blood, blood banks are screening for um, different types of infections. Diagnosing of syphilis can be challenging, and that is because the organism is uh, difficult to culture or it can even be seen by a light microscopy. So we need a special type of microscopy to see it. And it appears, um, um, it could be diagnosed with uh, dark, mic dark field microscopy, which is a rapid form, of micro uh, rapid form of diagnosis. However, it does require an expert who can, um, who can, um, who can use this uh, microscopy. Um, so the dark field microscopy is actually limited to use, uh, to use for primary and secondary syphilis, and that is because patients in the uh, primary and secondary, secondary uh, stages of syphilis have lesions that are active, so they could be sampled and taken to microscopy. And like I said, it is an obligate um, parasite, so once it's out of the body, it tends to die and you can't um, have it longer, or it is actively replicating in primary and secondary. Uh, you can have false negative in the later stages of syphilis, and that is because mostly patients are asymptomatic and they don't have those active lesions. There are some antibody testing that can also be done. So they're divided into two types. The first one is non tri uh, tri uh, non um, antibody testing, which is very, uh, which is non-specific to the organism, and a positive, a positive result initially has to be confirmed by a uh, troponemal te antibody testing. So, a troponemal antibody testing is more direct against the pallidum antigen compared to um, the non-troponemal antibody. Um, the non-troponemal antibody testing is actually really helpful in assessing treatment efficacy, and that is because we're looking at the drop in antibody at the time of infection after treatment, and then kind of um, trending that throughout, um, which we'll be talking about in follow-up. So you want to see a fourfold drop in the antibody, which basically means that the body doesn't have to keep making antibody to fight off this um, infection. So initially, when patients present with active syphilis not treated, they're going to have a higher antibody titer. However, after you treat them, the titer keeps trending down. Um, troponemal antibody, it is very specific and sensitive uh, for the antibody that is uh, targeted for the pallidum antigen. However, it's going to stay positive for the rest of the patient's um, the patient's uh, course, and that is because once the patient makes an antibody, it's always going to be in the body. So it's not helpful to diagnose, uh, but it's helpful to kind of confirm a positive non um diagnosis. <clears throat> in some clinical presentations or the different stages of syphilis, and these stages can actually overlap, so it doesn't always flow in one way. <clears throat> It can, var it can vary from anywhere from incubation and patients can have a primary stage 
um, or stage one syphilis and then uh, progress into stage two and CNS involvement can happen at any of these stages as well. And we'll be going over these stages one by one. <clears throat> so the incubation period is gonna be from the time of exposure from contact and it can last up to 90 days. And then during this incubation time, a primary or a secondary syphilis can occur, so it doesn't really have to wait until 90 days of um, incubation. So the primary stage, um, the most um, uh, very unique um, symptom that you will see associated with primary is gonna be shankers. So it's gonna be a single painless lesion that happens on a body, on any part of the body, and it's mostly painless and uh, eventually it might progress to a full-on rash um, or a lesion um, so when we talk about secondary. But in primary, we're basically seeing only one lesion that is highly infectious in this case. And you can even get syphilis by um, contact. If there's a breakdown in skin and you touch um, this chanker, it could be very infectious. So it can, these chanker, so a single lesion can happen anywhere either on, um, it can happen on the penis, it can happen on the lip or the tongue, uh, it basically doesn't uh, discrim discriminate and it just kind of basically happens from the site of infection. And those lesions are actually where the, con the spirochetes are concentrated, so that's why the, it's highly infectious at that point. Sorry, I'm like seeing some faces there like. All right, secondary uh, syphilis. <clears throat> this is associated with, uh, associated with diffuse rash and mainly that's gonna be on the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. And those are mostly common, but uh, the rash can happen on um, any part of the body as well. But the most characteristic ones are gonna be um, the hands as well as the feet. You can have multi-system um, involvement in the secondary stage, and that is because the, uh, the bacteria has started going into the rest of the body from the site of infection or from the shanker. So they, it has started disseminating. So um, as you can see, the palms of the hand and the feet, um, you can see this diffuse rash or even on the back of um, this patient. Uh, these lesions can also happen in the mucosal membrane, such as um, the mouth as well. Um, going into stage three and um, tertiary syphilis. <clears throat> so this, the latent actually happens um, later on, about four to 10 weeks after um, exposure or secondary um, stage if left untreated. So the body kind of overcomes that and clears it out. Um, and the patient is asymptomatic. Some patients can have a multi-system involvement. However, uh, in general, they're gonna be more um, asymptomatic. And this is actually called the hidden stage. And patients can uh, transmit syphilis to their partners at this time as well. Um, and then going into tertiary or stage four, um, this one uh, is actually um, kind of a multi-organ, multi-system involvement, and it has, it has disseminated into the heart, into the brain, as well as the, bo the bones and the joints. <clears throat> um, and what you basically see in this stage is uh, the gumatis uh, lesion. So this is basically soft, non-benign, um, uh, non-cancerous lesions that basically are just there. They don't, they look like cancer, but they are not cancerous. And I'll show you what they look like. So basically you have a lesion that a skin heals over and that there is some bacteria uh, concentrated in those areas as well. Neurosyphilis, so this, um, this complication can happen at any stage of syphilis. And it, most times it's associated, it doesn't have symptoms, but some patients can present with neurological symptoms. Um, and it can be divided into early or late neuro, 
um, syphilis. <clears throat> so the early one is actually associated with some um, cranial nerve um, deficit or even stroke associated with syphilis. And then once you go into the later stage, you start seeing more of a, paral a paralysis or even ocular involvement of uh, syphilis. Going into treatment, so um, parenteral uh, penicillin is going to be the treatment of choice for all stages of um, syphilis. It has been shown to be the drug of choice and alternative agents are not as effective or there isn't enough data to support the treatment um, using these uh, alternatives. So the treatment is basically going to be the same for primary and secondary, um, just a one-time dose of uh, ben benzathine uh, penicillin G, a one-time dose long-acting, um, and then some, we will be talking about who qualifies for these um, alternative agents as well. And then once you go into the late latent uh, syphilis, you need to give them three more doses of the same, the same uh, uh, penicillin formulation. And then going into tertiary syphilis, um, which will be the same treatment as uh, the latent syphilis, and then going into neurosyphilis, this is gonna be a longer treatment duration just because you have a CNS involvement in this case, and you need um, um, uh, an IV or continuous infusion every, six, every four hours or a um, continuous infusion administration and being treated for a minimum of 10 to 14 days. Uh, some alternative regimen, which is not always recommended due to um, lack of adherence in patients would be um, administration of procaine uh, penicillin, IM, on, and then taking uh, uh, probenicid four times a day. So you can see how patients might not be complying with this because you're giving them four times a day tablet for 10 to 14 days. So a lot of times patients are going to be treated with the aqueous um, um, crystalline penicillin. Uh, when you have the uh, tertiary syphilis or neurosyphilis, data out there is very limited for alternative treatment. And that is because it's such a rare complication that you won't even, uh, there isn't a lot of data supporting alternative and it's important to get um, infectious disease specialists um, involved in the treatment of these infections. And some things to note about penicillin formulation, I'm not gonna go through these, but these are some of the things to keep in mind and why we use one over the other and why we don't use oral formulation for the treatment of syphilis. Uh, jarish herxmeyer reaction is an important, um, an important topic to cover because it is associated with um, the treatment of syphilis in about 70 to 80% of the patients. And it's basically a reaction that the patient is getting that looks like sepsis. And it can, <clears throat> it can present as fever, chills, or headache, or even hypotension requiring uh, pressors. And so it's the time course that it takes to, for the patient to see this is gonna be the first two hours after administration. So they can get this reaction as soon as they take the first dose. <clears throat> And it tends to peak at eight hours, but resolves within a day or two. We can pre-treat this type of reaction with analgesics or even steroids. Um, even though they don't treat it, um, they kind of alleviate the symptoms so the patient is more comfortable. This should definitely not be confused with allergy. Um, and it should not be reported as, al as an allergy because it's a very common uh, reaction, and this is associated because when you are treating the spirochete with antibiotic, it tends to break, break down and release endotoxin, which the host, um, the host cells are, um, the, whole, the host defense is replying to. Um, some follow-ups for syphilis. So patients who are uh, diagnosed with syphilis are at a high risk for HIV infection and they should be following up as well, and the CDC recommends that as well. Um, these patients should have a tighter uh, trending done, and that is because we wanna monitor how well they're responding or 
uh, if, there is a, if we're at any risk for treatment failure. So patients with primary and secondary syphilis should follow up at six months and 12 months and compare their antibody titer and see if there's a drop. Um, if there is a uh, more than four, uh, four to six fold drop, it basically tells us that the treatment has been um, successful. And then if they're on the latent or tertiary syphilis, they have to follow up, up until two years. If patients are treated for neurosyphilis, uh, we should be examining their CSF every six months until it normalizes and they don't have any abnormal CSF. Uh, for patients who are co-infected with HIV, they should have more frequent, and the CDC actually recommends every three months follow-up for these patients, every three or every six months um, compared to um, the other ones, and that is because they're at high risk for infection um, with other um, STIs. We should also be evaluating potential, uh, we should also be ev uh, evaluating uh, patients' partners for potential treatment if they're at risk for infection. All right. So we're gonna have a patient case before finishing syphilis. We have MP who is a 21 year old female who returns to clinic today with complaints of general feeling unwell. She states she just noticed the appearance of a rash on her body about two days ago. She also complains of a low grade fever and her throat is a little sore. Her social history reveals um, that she has new sexual partner about three months ago. They had not been re reliably be reliably uh, using protection. Her total lifetime number of partners is approximately 14, day, 14 partners. The physician completes a thorough workup and uh, is concerned about HIV and syphilis. She has no known drug allergies. <clears throat> this patient's history and presentation are most consistent with which stage of syphilis? The majority thinks that she has secondary. Can someone explain why you think she has secondary symptoms, secondary stage of syphilis? She has rash, flu-like symptoms. Yeah, those are all um, the symptoms that this patient has, so which is consistent with um, primary, uh, secondary uh, syphilis, and it wouldn't be primary because primary is mostly associated with that single lesion uh, known as chancre, but this patient is presenting with flu-like symptoms as well as rash. <clears throat> Serologic testing is performed and is consistent with secondary syphilis. Which of the following is the most appropriate therapy for a patient? Any questions about syphilis before I move forward? Yeah. Um, since it's more common in males, is that like, is it just because of the virus itself, or like, is it like men are more prone to get it, or that they're being exposed more? 
Um, if, while the reported cases are in men and MSM, and um, that's the, the thought is that um, they're, they have more high-risky behaviors than MSM compared to men who have sex with women, mm -hmm. um, and that is the thought behind it. And that's just the reported case, unless you know something. Like that. No, it's it, the majority of cases are made up from MSM mm -hmm. and men who have sex with both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably, I would think, some of the, the behaviors associated with it is why they just have a higher incidence. Mm -hmm. But I've not seen something specifically with the virus itself where men would have a higher risk. For a lot of the other infections, one of the reasons why women are consistently listed as a risk factor is because of the complications of the disease are more common in women and are much worse in women usually. Yes. Um, will patients test positive during all four stages or only during the first two? So the first two, they will test positive for all, all four, and that depends on what type of test that we're doing. So the first two are going to be, if they're tested under uh, dark field microscopy, that's going to give us a high sensitivity and specificity, so they will be positive, versus if he used a, a sample or a specimen from a third and uh, fourth stage, you wouldn't have a positive. It will be uh, false, po uh, false negative. Um, and but then if you do a titer or an antibody testing, uh, patients will actually have an antibody against the uh, tropomina uh, pallidum for the rest of their life. Basically, once they're infected for the specific uh, tropominal uh, testing. However, for the none one, you're basically tracking the titer to make sure that the um, that the treatment has been uh, efficacious. Uh, so they might not test positive for the, the non one. No, okay. Any other questions? Okay, we're gonna finish up with the viral infections. And we're gonna talk about genital herpes. Uh, so we'll be talking about HSV1 and HSV2 and their treatment courses. Um, herpes is actually not uh, CDC tracked and it's not a reportable um, STI. Uh, the most the, it, it is the most cause of genital um, ulceration in the United States and actually it is underreported um, or even underdiagnosed and this is what because patients don't even know they have it sometimes or they don't present um, to clinic for testing unless they're in pain. Some risk factors associated with HSV or herpes uh, virus is gonna be sexual behavior again, and history of prior STD. Um, STD or even um, HIV puts patients at risk for um, HSV infection. And the female gender is actually at risk for infection, and that is because it's easier to transmit HSV from male to female than it is to um, transfer HSV from female to male. It is that um, HSV is a DNA virus, so it can be identified using a PCR. So it is divided into um, herpes simplex one, uh, which is most commonly associated with cold sores, and then HSV two is actually associated with genital herpes. <clears throat> The oral HSV is actually um, acquired in childhood and most people um, tend to have cold sore. However, we are seeing an increased cases of genital um, HSV1 um, among young adults and that is uh, due to their uh, oral genital uh, pra sexual practices, uh, kind of transmitting that from their cold sore into um, the genitalium. Herpes 2 virus, um, is actually most common uh, in genital herpes. Um, not a, uh, is most common in genital herpes, and it is actually underdiagnosed, un unrecognized with, um, and that and that is because patients are mostly asymptomatic, so they don't even know that they have HSV. And we'll be talking about the pathophysiology as well. It is estimated over 50 million people have HSV. Too. And this is, considering that it is underdiagnosed and underrecognized, you can tell that this is an underestimation of a number. So 
So going into the pathophysiology, uh, first at site of infection, what you have is you're basically having this virus go through the body uh, due to a breakdown of the skin. So what happens is once the virus gets into the body, it creates a primary infection, you get infected, and then it, it tends to go into the spinal cord and hides in the nerves and it becomes more dormant, or that's like the latency um, area, the latent area, the latent time. And then uh, due to either um, stress, it could be physical or emotional stress, it could be immunosuppression, um, or even sunlight and cold sore um, example, uh, you can reactivate this virus, which causes the virus to come out of the, um, this, these neurons that it was hiding in and it causes two things. Either it can reactivate, uh, it can uh, form a reoccurrence, which is basically it goes through the skin and forms new lesions. And once you have that new lesion, you have a reoccurrent infection. And the other uh, path that it can take is it goes through the skin, but it doesn't cause any new lesions, but it, it has the shedding of the virus. So patients can also transmit this uh, virus to their partners without being symptomatic. So in both cases, it's highly infectious. And once patients have HSV, they'll have it for life. There is no cure for HSV. Um, and it's gonna keep reoccurring depending on, depending on the patient um, and depending on the type of infection, that, the, depending on the HSV one versus two. The transmission can be either sexually or perinatally from a mother to a fetus. And the incubation period is estimated to be two to 14 days. Um, testing, again, is done by um, either a culture or a PCR or molecular testing. Um, even though the culture, the culture has low sensitivity and it is not able to, it has a very um, slow turnaround time, so you might not be able to get a result as fast as possible. PCR is more sensitive and um, specific and it's increasingly available um, to a lot of clinics and laboratories and it is able to um, actually identify HSV1 versus HSV2. Some other tests that could be used are going to be antibody testing as well uh, which can help us identify HSV1 or HSV2. Um, antibodies uh, normally form um, during the first uh, several weeks after infection and persist indefinitely. So patients will always t test positive uh, once they are infected with HSV because they keep making antibodies against the virus. The clinical presentation can be divided into first um, episode. So this is gonna be the first infection um, that the patient is exposed, after exposure, they get a first infection. So it's gonna be associated with multiple lesions um, in the area of infection. Um, so the difference between here, um, HSV versus syphilis, is you have multiple lesions in the genital area. Uh, the patient can present with flu-like symptoms um, initially, and then it can progress into um, and patients can actually get over that without being treated um, after a, a couple of weeks. Uh, the severity of symptoms are, is actually greater in uh, females than it is in male. And patients who are immunocompromised, just because they are not able to fight off the infection, they will be at risk for um, severe uh, symptoms as well. Um, and then, uh, clinical presentation can also be divided into reoccurrent episodes. So once the patient uh, gets over the first occurrence, they get infected, the virus goes into the ganglia and hides there. And um, due to whatever reason, it reactivates and causes a reinfection. Uh, patients are actually able to detect if they're going to get it, uh, if, they're, if they're going to get reinfect, uh, they're going to get a uh, reoccurrence through a, pro, a prodromal symptom, and that is associated with like burning or itching of the genital area, so they, they can, just like a, a migraine, they're able to detect when they're gonna um, have that reoccurrence of the infection. 
It is less severe than the primary infection. So whenever a patient is um, initially infected, they tend to have more severe infection. And later on um, in the reoccurrent episodes, it's gonna be less um, severe. And that is because the body's all already used to it and they have formed an antibody against it. And viral shedding can actually last up to four days, um, even if a patient doesn't have a symptom, a symptom, or if, even if they do. So some of the um, lesions that are associated with herpes are gonna be multiple lesions. So in the primary lesions, you can see how there are more lesions compared to the reoccurrent herpes. So they don't get as many as the primary one. <clears throat> Um, some complications associated with HSV is going to be a uh, secondary infection of the lesion. So uh, these lesions are open and they can get infected with a bacterial infection if the patient is not taking care of the lesion and cleaning it and um, kind of uh, protecting it from bacterial infection. They can also auto-inoculate, so if, they, um, if they're not uh, as clean, they can infect another part of their genitalium as well. Um, HSV can also be associated with some uh, disseminated infections such as um, meningitis or encephalitis or even neonatal transmissions, um, but we will, we will not be talking about that today. <clears throat> so like I said, there is no cure for HSV and we are basically treating to decrease the duration of symptoms. And it is important to start treatment within the first um, 20, uh, uh, 24 to 72 hours while the lesion is still active in order to suppress the replication of the bacteria, uh, the virus, excuse me. Uh, some first line um, agents are gonna be acyclovir, valacyclovir, and famcyclovir. And those are uh, equally effective in treating a first reoccurrence. If patients are not responding in um, seven to 10 days, therapy can be prolonged for them. Um, treatment of the occurrence, it's important uh, for patients to be able to identify their prodrome. That way they can um, get their treatment started as fast as possible so it could be effective. And the only thing that is gonna be helpful for is just shortening the duration of the symptom or even um, kind of alleviating those symptoms associated with the um, lesions. So a lot of times patients might have a prescription at hand and they will know when um, they're gonna get reinfect, uh, have a reoccurrence and they will take their prescription, which we'll be talking about chronic suppression therapy. <clears throat> So taking chronic suppressive therapy can actually decrease the rate of uh, reoccurrence by 70 to 80%, which is really huge for patients who are uncomfortable or in pain because these lesions are really painful once they occur. It can also reduce transmission to partners if we start patients on um, re uh, chronic suppression, as well as improve the quality of life of the patient um, especially if there are risk for reoccurrent, uh, reoccurrent infection. So some, um, so we're gonna be using the same um, treatment options. So acyclovir, valcyclovir, and famcyclovir. For episodic, we tend to treat it for, um, for the duration for three to five days. Um, compared to chronic suppressions, patients are gonna be on this for a long term. Um, famcyclovir has been shown not to be as effective as acyclovir or va uh, valacyclovir um, in, for the suppression of HSV. And, put it, and taking into consideration um, how many times patients have to take it, the cost of the medication um, is also important <coughs> as well in deciding which agent to choose. <clears throat> uh, patients with HSV infection should be counseled um, as well as their sexual partner and to prevent uh, transmission of this HSV. And patients, once they have HSV, they'll have it for life, but um, making sure that they are not symptomatic and they're not, um, a shell, if they know that they're gonna be uh, 
have reoccurrence, having that chronic suppression on hand is really helpful for them um, in order to prevent those symptoms. All right, we're gonna finish up with a long case. Um, we have GP, who's a 32-year-old male recently diagnosed with HIV. During his initial workup, he's found to have genital ulcers, uh, which he describes as painful. He states he gets these lesions once in a while and has never been treated for them. The physician sends a specimen of culture to the lab and gives the patient a preliminary diagnosis of HSV. He has no known drug allergies. He tells the physician that he hates taking medication in front of people and would like whatever is the least amount of times per day. Which of the following agent is most appropriate for this patient? <clears throat> so in this case, <clears throat> it's split up. Um, so any of these um, treatment options are appropriate except for gencyclovir. We don't want to give them gencyclovir ID. So acyclovir, famcyclovir, and valacyclovir are appropriate. But in this patient case, what is what are some what are some things to keep in mind? So he gets it once in a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else? What stands out to you guys in this patient? Least amount of times a day. Yeah, exactly. Um, so which of these medications have the least amount of um, time that you have to take them? The frequency, which has the less? Okay. Valgenzer, uh, val valacyclovir, right? Because you take that um, BID compared to for four to five times a day of acyclovir or even pemcyclovir. So just keeping that in mind for our patient, not only the cost of the medication, but also how many times are they taking it? Are they gonna be compliant? Or uh, what are their preferences as well is important. So in this case, valacyclovir uh, is gonna be the right answer. Any questions? Yeah. So we be treating this, is this the first clinical episode? Or is this like we use the drugs for Um, so he states that he gets these lesions <laughs> once in a while. Um, so you would want to treat it as a first time because this is the first time he is presented. First of all, asking him if he's ever been treated for those once in a while cases is important. If he has, uh, we can treat him as episodic because he is asymptomatic. But if he tells you that he gets this uh, once in a while when he gets stressed out or he gets it multiple times in a month, uh, it might be important to put him on a chronic suppression just to kind of improve his quality of life just because he shouldn't be in pain multiple times a, a month. Versus if he gets it once a month, um, treating it more episodically, um, giving him um, like a prescription so he can take it whenever he thinks that he's gonna get these uh, symptoms is really important for him. So kind of like assessing the patient is important. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, and then um, the last few slides are just gonna be some um, helpful summaries that will be helpful for you to use when you're studying for your exam. Give you the extra. Give you the extra after this. So you'd like treat a flare and then put them on some 